Who is going to carry out the transformations that would make permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia? to this talk because like me you think that music matters I think that a huge number of people around the world feel that way and probably a big percentage of the human population has felt that music matters ever since human beings first walked on the planet over 100,000 years ago when our great ape ancestors first climbed down from the trees they would have realised quite quickly that the only way for them to survive was to work together to get what they needed from the environment social animals and in order to work together effectively we needed to develop language and from language would have come culture including almost certainly some sort of music so therefore music has been at the heart of the human experience ever since the beginning but what about music under class society which is a relatively recent development and in particular under capitalism well, certainly the ruling classes have defining the role of popular music and just about everything else under capitalism. As Karl Marx put it, ruling class ideas are in every epoch the ruling ideas. Um, after all, they own the big record companies, they own the big media outlets, they own the big festival venues and so on. In fact, there are some Marxist thinkers who think music is entirely in the pocket the ruling classes. There's a guy called Theodore Adorno, who was a member of the Frankfurt School of Marxist Intellectuals, who wrote a, a paper in 1940 called On Popular Music. And in that, he argued that popular music is part of the culture industry, which is designed simply to keep working class people distracted and placated and consuming. When you listen to the melodies of the popular music of that time, which was coming out of Tim Pan Alley, in the US. When you listen to the melodies, you are listening to examples of pseudo-individualization, Adorno argued, meaning fake attempts to give some sort of emotional authenticity to this uh, mass-produced nonsense. Now, he was quite a fan of classical music, so in a way, this was rather an elitist dismissal of popular music. He thought that music was a weapon of mass distraction, popular music. But there are other left-wing thinkers who have a completely different point of view. There are a number of thinkers who became loosely known as the culturalists in the 1960s and 70s, who recognised that the ruling class had their much revered high culture, uh, their classical music and their fine art and, this, and, and so on. And so therefore they argued that working class people should champion and celebrate quite uncritically our popular culture, our popular music, and so on. Now actually, the origins of that line of thought don't really lie in Marxism, but in the writings of a number of anarchist thinkers who were writing around the turn of the last century about proletarian art. Those ideas are sometimes given a bit of a Marxist veneer because some of those writers <coughs> quote uh, Karl Marx's correct assertion that the emancipation of the working class has to be the act of the working class. But by that, Marx didn't mean that everything the working class people do is good and everything that they're into is good. And he certainly didn't mean that we should dismiss all bourgeois culture. On the contrary, he was a big fan, certainly, of a lot of literature that would be considered part of bourgeois literature. And Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary, was very clear about this too. He argued that working class people should attempt to become experts in bourgeois culture in order one day to come up with something better. So I think, I think that we need to reject what I see as this false division between popular and high culture. Um, I think we need to be ready to appreciate and to criticise aspects of all culture. I think that both Adorno and the culturalists have got it wrong, that the social meaning, the political impact of popular music isn't fixed, but is actually contested. And I now want to look at the terrain in which that <coughs> contest takes place, with reference to the German philosopher Hegel, and the American guitarist Hendrix. Um, 
Bear with me. Um, I've got to look to my notes because this is going to pop up on the screen, but never mind. I won't, I won't bang on about what might have been. Hegel said something quite strange. He said a few strange things in my opinion, but this was one of them. The owl of Minerva takes flight at sunset. Now, I'm going to try and explain what he meant by that with reference to, to Jimi Hendrix. Now, when you ask a music lover about Jimi Hendrix, they will talk about Hendrix's genius, his amazing ability, his fantastic skills on the guitar, and what a cool guy he was. And all those things are, of course, true. But as Marxists, we recognise that if you really want to understand any individual, including Hendrix, you have to look beyond the individual to the society that they emerge from, and indeed the economic structures which underpin that society. Um, this is what Trotsky said about Hendrix. <laughs> it's here somewhere. <laughs> Of course, personal traits were necessary for the work, good or bad, that Jimmy performed. But under other historical conditions, these personal peculi peculiarities might have remained completely dormant, as is true of so many propensities and passions on which the social environment makes no demands. On the other hand, other qualities today crowded out or suppressed might have come to the fore. Above the subjective, there rises the objective. And in the final reckoning, it's the objective that decides. Actually, he was talking about himself in the introduction to, to his autobiography, but you get the point. Marxists recognise that consciousness comes from social being, and that in turn comes from economics, or to quote Trotsky again, culture feeds on the sap of economics. Now, of course, some of the better music critics will contextualise Jimi Hendrix in terms of the... Uh, the counterculture of the 1960s, the black civil rights movement, the movement against the Vietnam War, perhaps the influence of, of uh, hallucinogenic drugs. They might even go so far as to talk about the post-war economic boom that put a bit more money in the pockets of young people in America at that time. But Marxism would say, look deeper, that these things aren't always obvious. So Marxists, for example, might recognise that you wouldn't have had Jimi Hendrix without the Great Depression of the 1930s. Why? Because the popular music of the 1920s was big band <coughs> music. <coughs> Guitarists like me, or Jimmy, I like to compare people, I like to <laughs> Guitarists would sit at the back and just comp along, keeping time for the horn players. And it wasn't until the economic depression that those big bands had to get a lot smaller. A lot of the horn players were kicked out. And the guitar players, for the first time, were invited to come to the front of the stage and take solos to replace the missing horn players. Developments in valve uh, amplifier technology meant that they could compete for volume. And they could even get a bit of distortion on the sound of the guitar, so that they sounded a bit more like those raspy saxophones that they were replacing. It wasn't long before some showmen uh, started to take to the front of the stage. Great guitarists like Charlie Christian who became favourites with audiences and who influenced the whole new generation of guitarists, including Hendrix. No Great Depression, no Charlie Christian, no Charlie Christian, no Jimi Hendrix. Now the point here is not that economic depressions are good because they lead to Jimi Hendrix, far from it. <laughs> the point is that the relationship between the individual and society and economics is not an obvious one. It's a complex and contradictory one. Sometimes a dark moment economically can lead to something surprisingly <coughs> bright culturally. The owl of Minerva flies at sunset, takes flight at sunset. Um, the other important thing to, re to realise about this relationship is that it's not a one-way deterministic street. Actually, individuals can make decisions which influence society around them, and of course social movements can have an impact on the economic relations which underpin society too. So this is, a, this is a dialectical relationship in which ideas compete and collide and new ways of doing things emerge. And I think it's into that swirling dialectic, that battleground for the meaning of culture that we have to make an intervention as socialists in order to get the best for our side. Now, I think that some writers slightly duck talking about, some music critics, slightly duck talking about the sorts of complexities that I've tried to describe. 
by adopting a sort of a more nuanced version of the culturalists' view. They don't argue that all popular music is good, but they do tend to cherry-pick the good stuff and write about that so that they can continue to write as fans. Now, there's not necessarily anything wrong with this. Some people do it very well. Dorian Linsky's book, 33 Revolutions a Minute, is good. It looks at that rather exceptional set of songs and artists who consistently combine progressive politics with good music. And it's important to look seriously at those songs. Uh, Strange Fruit and Free Nelson Mandela and Fuck the Police and Shipbuilding. I mean, it's a long list, of course. Um, and those artists, Fela Kuti, Gil Scott Heron, how could I not mention him in this meeting? And, and, and Woody Guthrie and Arnie DeFranco, and, and, and you know, it, the list goes on and on. Um, and it's important to look at those, the lives of those artists and those songs, because sometimes those stories do, and those songs do, capture important moments in political struggle, important uh, moments in a set of social relations, important observations about a particular time and a particular place. Those songs are windows on the world, and they should be listened to as such. But if we want to understand the way the pop of the music operates in society more broadly, I think we need to look at the way that most people listen to music most of the time. We need to recognise that every time you turn on the TV and watch an episode of X Factor or American Idol, every time you watch a video on MTV or Beyonce at Glastonbury, you're being invited to internalise a set of values, a set of ideas about what's desirable, about what's normal, about what's sexy and about what matters. Don't worry, I can live without the audio. So, sorry, you've been running around for half an hour. Have you sorted it? I mean, you've um, sorted it. Well, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll let you have a go. Um, yeah, a set. All music, I think we have to recognise that all music has an ideological component, and therefore all music has political ramifications. So let's have a little look at what the different opposing groups in society do to make music better serve their particular agenda. Let's have a look at what the ruling classes are doing <coughs> at the moment. I think what the ruling classes have done recently is very interesting. Think again about American Idol and X Factor. It seems to me that the ruling classes are trying to make music in the image of the system that they have profited so well from. If you think about it. Young musicians are told that they have to compete with one another in order to succeed. There's kind of a democracy because people get to vote for the contestants, but it's a democracy very much filtered through the opinions of an unelected expert panel. And actually, whoever wins the contest, it's the same huge companies that profit. Because if you want to enter one of these competitions, you have to sign an exclusive deal with the same huge companies. I think in the UK, it's some sort of amalgamation of Simon Fuller's 19 management and uh, Simon Cowell's BMG, I'm not sure. Um, so that's, that's the first, the most recent, and I think quite interesting thing that they seem to be doing. Now, if they can't make music in their image, they will at least try and associate their image with music. I'm talking, of course, about the very visible corporate branding of music events, in particular summer festivals and tours and so on. And it's not surprising that they want to do this. If you think about those audiences, I had some images to play you, but you can cast your mind back at least to uh, moments of Glastonbury that you might have seen or gigs that you've been to yourself <coughs> recently. When people go to live music events, I think you see something quite incredible happen. They go kind of crazy, they jump up and down, they rip off their clothes, they shout at the top of their voices, they embrace strangers. It seems to me that there's a real sense of unity, a real shared celebration that the kind of the frustrations and the alienation of the working week can be forgotten, at least temporarily, at least for the length of the gig or the length of the festival. And that's a very powerful thing. And the way people respond to each other, it's as if the usual social relations which are imposed upon us by capitalism, it's as if those social relations are temporarily uh, uh, suspended or, or that we've transcended them temporarily. And that transcendental feeling is very powerful. No wonder that the big corporations want to try to associate themselves with that feeling. The implicit message is that that fantastic feeling, that's what Smirnoff is all about, that's what Vodafone is all about. <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. And quite often, that can lead to really contradictory situations for musicians, as I discovered myself. 
I was in faith, uh, I was touring with faith this way back in 97 when we were invited to go to South Africa. Now, Mandela was still in power. Don't forget, he'd only been elected in 94. There weren't many bands that had been over there yet. We were a multiracial band. This was Mandela's South Africa freed from apartheid. It felt like an incredibly politically progressive thing just to be going there in that context. Until I discovered that the tour was very visibly sponsored by Camel Cigarettes. And the the committee of people who welcomed us on the first night took us out for dinner and I said to the woman next to me, what's your job? She said, my job is to get 18 to 25 year olds to smoke. <laughs> and that's true. And I suddenly realised that that's why we were there. We were there to make her job easier. And so you realise that, you know, that these things are very complicated. We were there to get more people to smoke in a society only just free from the shackles of apartheid. So those sorts of contradictions crop up a lot, I think, for musicians. Now, the other thing, of course, that the ruling class can do is simply to use music directly to advertise either their own public image or uh, the products that they're trying to sell. Now, this actually predates capitalism. If you think about it, a lot of musicians in pre-capitalist class society had to seek the, pa the patronage of kings and queens uh, in order <coughs> to survive. And their job was not only to entertain uh, the establishment in that way, but also to promote the public image of those people. And that's true not only in Europe, but in parts of Africa with the Griot system and parts of Asia. Now, under capitalism... Okay. Excuse me one second, I think we might... Have... <coughs> don't worry, really, it's not... It's, I don't think it's worth the, uh, the potential <coughs> Okay, maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Is that projecting up there? <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? In South Africa? Somebody remind me. <laughs> Actually, I've moved on to the, um, the, uh, the test, which I'm afraid you will fail. <laughs> I was in the courts of queens and kings, in, 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 yeah, so under capitalism, of course, musicians have to seek the patronage not of the kings and queens in the same way, but the patronage of the advertising houses of Soho and Manhattan and so on. And we shouldn't underestimate how important this is for a lot of musicians. The value of record sales for musicians has dropped very considerably. And lots of the musicians that I know now rely on getting what we call sinks, on getting their music used in adverts, or in films, Hollywood films, you know, whatever it may be. Now, I don't blame struggling musicians for taking that paycheck. We all need to pay the rent and put bread on the table. But I'll tell you what, some of the richest, best established producers in the world are completely comfortable with this relationship. Quincy Jones, one of the most prolific and certainly best paid uh, music producers of all time, possibly, pop pop music producers of all time, casually refers to music as being an emotion lotion that can be put on the soundtracks of films. Now, I haven't sort of theorised this in any detail. Perhaps you can help me, but I, I find that disturbing somehow. So let's look at what our side can do to improve music, to, make, to sharpen music up as a weapon with which to change the world. Now, one thing that, um, one thing that people have tried is to make music without the commercial considerations and the sort of the ideological assumptions that you would usually have in, uh, <coughs> under capitalism. In other words, musicians have tried to play with, with the form of music in quite radical ways and have done so with an explicitly political agenda. This sort of avant-garde music is probably most associated with a number of uh, American musicians that came out of the jazz scene in the 1950s and 60s, Archie Sheff and Max Roach and Ornette Coleman and others, but there's also a very important aspect to this scene in Europe, including in Britain. Uh, the free jazz scene became the free improvised scene and um, <coughs> actually there's a group of musicians who are based in Sheffield in the 1960s who I think made some of the most interesting music along these lines. I was hoping to play you some, but I, it's, let me see where we are on this. Is the volume up down there? Where's Jimmy? Where's Charlie Christian? Are you singing in this one? Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
entirely pertinent to the talk, but um, forgive me, I think it might be an interesting aside for some of you. That album, it's called Carrie Obin by the Spontaneous Music Ensemble, a group of musicians based in Sheffield. John Stevens was the drummer. He went on to set up Community Music, the college in London at which the Asian Dub Foundation met, incidentally. But that album was recorded a year before Miles Davis recorded In a Silent Way. And I think bits of it sound a lot like In a Silent Way. And you know what, there's a musician in common, the bass player, Dave Holland. So, I don't know, maybe someone in this room, maybe Martin Smith, maybe somebody can enlighten me as to whether there really is some sort of connection between the two. If there was a connection between the two, then that is by far the biggest impact in terms of numbers of people reached that this music has ever had. This music's pretty obscure, quite hard a lot of the time. And, uh, and I think therein lies its problem when we talk about music and politics. It's pretty niche. It doesn't have purchase with... Uh, with, with a huge number of people. I'm reminded a bit of what Lenin said. Lenin said we need to be one step uh, ahead of the class, but not two. And in this context, what I take that to mean is that we need to persuade people that they should move in a particular direction, in the right direction, but we need to do it in a language which actually people can understand and which appeals to people. I'm also reminded of the Russian futurists who Trotsky was quite dismissive of. The Russian futurists were an artistic movement who argued for a radical break with the past. But Trotsky said, you know what, we, we're part of a tradition, and that doesn't make us lesser revolutionaries. In a sense, if you want to know what music will sound like <coughs> after capitalism, you first of all have to get rid of capitalism. So much as I like this sort of music, I think there's real problems with that approach to political music. Um, perhaps a more obvious way of making political music is to make pop music with, uh, with explicitly political lyrics. And I've mentioned some of the artists already who do that so fantastically well. Now, although it's a long list of artists that do it well, it's, it can actually be surprisingly difficult to get it right. I want to read to you a criticism, a review, of, um, of the second album of my band, Slovo. And I want to read this to you for two reasons. Now, the criticism sort of underlines how you can get it wrong, even though I think it's completely unfair. <laughs> But the, the other reason why I want to read it to you is because actually the criticism I wear is a bit of a badge of honour and I suspect this is one audience that might get what I mean. Um, I won't read out the whole thing, I'll just get to the nasty stuff at the end. Um, oh, I need some good stuff towards the end. At its peaks, it has ferocious snarling teeth, fully utilising the meat paste, trip hop, chilling atmospherics, it's all here. In its valleys. It, it, its occasionally hectoring nature gives the feeling of being battered rhythmically over the head with the socialist worker. <laughs> the BBC review of my second album. So there you go. Um, <laughs> but the real problem, actually, is that not all artists want to make explicitly political music, and there should be room for love songs, as Sheikh Guevara rightly said, revolutionaries are inspired by great feelings of love. There should be room for ambiguity and nuance in all art, including music, and we need to find a way of engaging artists who don't make explicitly political music, still engaging them in political activity. And I think one very good example of that that's around at the moment is love, music, hate, racism. Whatever, you know, whether or not your lyrics are ex uh, explicitly political, you can show your support for NMHR, you can register your opposition to racism and fascism in the BNP, you can do a gig for Love Music Hate Racism, you can put the banner on the website, you can wear the t-shirt in your press conference and so on. And of course the forerunner of Love Music Hate Racism was Rock Against Racism and there'll be some people at this conference this weekend who actually were at the heart of setting that up back in the late 70s. Rock Against Racism got 100,000 people into Victoria Park, got the clash on stage with Aswad, got uh, wrestlers meeting punks, and really made common, or helped to make anti-racism common sense for a new generation. It was a fantastic movement. And as I say, you'll speak to some people who were at the heart of that at the time, but I want to read out a quote from somebody who was in the Socialist Workers' Party, but won't be here this weekend because he died a few years ago. 
Um, I want to read out what he said about rock against racism, because I think his words are a great manifesto for art and music in general. His name is David Widrum. He's, he was a, just an East End physician, but a, a great activist. And this is what he said. We aimed to rescue the energy of, Ru of Russian revolutionary art, surrealism and rock and roll from the galleries, the advertising agencies and the record companies, and to use them again to change reality as had always been intended, and have a party in the process. <laughs> so I, I think that's brilliant. The, the perhaps the best thing of all about Rock Against Racism is that you didn't have to be in a signed band this was something which people were encouraged to do at the grassroots. Your local punk band could just put on a Rock Against Racism gig in the local church hall or whatever. And I think that's fantastically important too. One thing that artists who do have a bit of a profile, who are signed, who have a profile in the media, one thing that they can do, of course, is to use the platform afforded to them by their music to make political statements. And... Um, this is something which I think we should encourage musicians to do, but again, there are problems. I mean, a lot of musicians aren't working class in a straightforward sense. Many of them are self-employed and sit at home practicing, hoping the phone will ring for many hours. And they can sometimes be a little bit out of touch with different political movements. They can be a bit behind the curve politically. And let's be clear, they don't have a democratic mandate to speak for a political uh, movement. Sometimes they get it wrong. I mean, sometimes musicians just have bad politics too. So there's nothing automatically good, of course, about what people will say in interviews. But even when musicians get it right, or perhaps particularly when musicians get it right, there's another problem that crops up, and that is that they can suffer in their <coughs> careers. I fear I might have had a glimpse of this myself. I was in South Africa, again with Faithless, but this time just last year. I don't really fear it, by the way. Um, but I was invited by an organisation called Artists Against Apartheid in South Africa to record a radio advert which compared South Africa in the bad old days of apartheid with Israel now and encouraged people to boycott, to join the cultural boycott of Israel. And this radio advert went out on the equivalent of Radio 1 and it caused quite a stir. The Zionists in South Africa are very well organised and they first of all lobbied the radio station. The radio station stood their ground and they said, well, this doesn't incite violence, it's, we, we're going to continue to run it, we don't have a problem with this. So next they lobbied the promoters of the Faithless Tour and the promoters became convinced that the Zionists would at the very least pick it for Faithless gigs, if not make some sort of an attempt on my life. So there was all sorts of extra security brought in, sniffer dogs, it took ages to get to get the, uh, the punters, as we call them, the crowd, into the gig. Um, in fact, of course, neither of the above happened. Often the Zionists bark is worse than the bite. But the manager flew out from, uh, from London and sat me down and said, Dave, why have you created this shitstorm? And I told him, I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry that you've had to deal with a shitstorm, but actually, you know, I'm proud of what I've done and I'd do it again in a moment. But who knows what the long-term consequences might be uh, all I do know is that other musicians who have been asked about this in the past do feel that this can, uh, this can cause problems. There's a seminal book called, the Black Nation uh, called Black Nationalism and the Revolution in Music by Frankowski, written in 1970. And in that book, he interviews some of those radical jazz musicians that I talked about. And several of them uh, say that they feel that their, their uh, careers have been adversely affected by speaking out. Quite often in support of national liberation struggles, actually, <coughs> at that time. Of course, you know, that isn't a reason to not do it, but, but potentially it's, it's something which, which we need to look at and be aware of. Um, <coughs> yeah, and talking of Israel and South Africa, sometimes the right thing for musicians <coughs> to do is to refuse to play. Sometimes. Now, it doesn't have to be the boycott of a whole country. It could be the boycott of a, a venue that's been homophobic or whatever, but sometimes if there's a properly supported and coordinated campaign for boycotts, then I think it's exactly the right thing to do to join that campaign. And one such example, in my opinion, is the cultural boycott of Israel at the moment as part of the broader boycott, divestment and, sh and sanctions campaign. <coughs> now, if you want to ask me why I think it's right to boycott Israel, you're welcome to do so, but if you're interested in that, I would 
Most of all, I urge you to go to the next session about BDS, at which Omar Baguti and others are speaking. But um, I want to use what remains of my time to say a few other things. I mean, on the question of the cultural boycott, we can all play a part, music fans and political activists can play a part, because these days, like never before, you can speak directly to acts via Facebook. So if you see an act has booked a gig in Tel Aviv or some other part of Israel, you can get on Facebook and try and persuade them that they should cancel it. Or if an artist joins the cultural boycott, you should send a message of support. I can tell you from my own personal, um, from my own personal experiences that that makes a huge difference. So, you know, we should think about using the internet and Facebook in that way around the question of cultural boycott, in particular the cultural boycott of Israel. A mention of the internet leads me to, to the last of the things that NSI can think about doing in terms of sharpening up music as a weapon for changing the world. And that, of course, is expanding media, which we have some control over. I did an interview with an internet radio station the other day. I think it was called Rebel Radio, based up in... Cambridge. And it's brilliant. It was a brilliant show. They were talking about the strikes. They were talking about Palestine. They played Slovo, Freedom for Palestine and Loki, back to back. It was a fantastic program for all sorts of reasons. Now, I think more of us should do that. And if anyone in this room has got experience of how you set up an internet radio station, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to hear more. I'd be interested in getting involved in doing something like that because, of course, we do need uh, more of our own media or of our own media outlets. Um, let me see if I can start to wind up by playing you a piece of music. <laughs> just a band. <laughs> to paraphrase Karl Marx, musicians have sung about the world in many different ways. The point, however, the point, however, is to change it. Now, I've been a professional musician for a long time now and a music lover for much longer, but I don't think for a moment that music on its own can change the world. Listening to music and making music should never be a substitute for going on demonstrations, supporting works on strike and getting politically organised. I would urge people to think about joining the Socialist Workers' Party this weekend. It's important that we're organised in the fight <coughs> against capitalism and for a better world. But music can play its part. And I've given you some ideas, hopefully some thoughts, about how it can better play its part. Now I'm very interested to hear what your thoughts <coughs> are. Thank you for listening. <coughs> 